Good morning, it's Mr. Lotzenheiser. Today is Thursday, April 9th. It's the 138th day of the school year and the 18th day of our uh, experience with remote learning. Grumpy Cat says, have an idea, keep it to yourself. I disagree with him today because I've got some ideas to share with you about the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Uh, you're probably going to hear some wind in the background. It's howling around my house this morning, as it probably is yours today as well. It's crazy. It was like 70 degrees Ohio beach weather yesterday, and now we're back in the polar vortex, it seems, here in beautiful Van Wert County, Ohio. On your screen, you're going to see a slide from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. If you haven't checked out Monticello's website uh, recently, you're definitely going to use it next week as we're going to transition into um, Thomas Jefferson's administration. Uh, so spoiler alert, John Adams is not going to be reelected re in the election of 1800. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the reasons why Adams likely was defeated, and that was the public response to the Alien and Sedition Acts, as well as the, as well as the politically motivated response by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and their Democrat Republicans as they respond to the Alien and Sedition Acts. So before we look at the, the documents specifically, I wanna show you a map and you should be able to see it on your screen. This is a, an unofficial map of the United States of America by 1798. And that's the time frame we're gonna be working with, 1798 into 1799 in today's discussion. So. Adams is on his way to securing peace with the French and ending the quasi war with them that escalated um, during and after the XYZ affair. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Kentucky, Res Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, which take place in the state legislatures of Virginia and Kentucky. So, yeah, we're talking about Kentucky and we haven't really in the past. And you'll notice that We've gained some states since our original 13. During the Washington administration into the Adams administration, we gained Vermont, which was carved out of uh, land that was disputed between uh, primarily New York and New Hampshire. They had pretty much considered themselves an independent state for some time, but now it's going to be made official. We also have Tennessee, the volunteer state, which is going to be carved out of North Carolina extending to the Mississippi River, and then Kentucky, which is going to be carved out of Virginia as well. You can see down here some of our other states look kind of big. Georgia's kind of big, and it won't be long until we're going to have Mississippi territory carved out of that, which will end up being uh, two separate states right here. And then there's the Northwest Territory. Still not states yet. However, it won't be long until the 17th state will be added to the Union in March 1803, and that's the heart of it all, the great state of Ohio in the wild, wild west of the Northwest Territory. I'm gonna come back to the map um, in a little bit, but I kind of want to uh, talk a little bit about the Alien Sedition Acts first. We'll remember that the Alien Sedition Acts were passed by Congress in an, in an attempt to give the President of the United States more power to deal with two specific groups. One, uh, people that may came, come to the United States of America in a legal manner as aliens or immigrants hoping to become citizens, but that Congress dominated by members of the Federalist Party were concerned that might be saboteurs or might be actively um, embedded spies working against the United States government, economy and military. It also wasn't a, a political attempt by the Federalist Party to neutralize uh, potential new recruits to the Democrat Republican Party to keep them from becoming citizens, making it uh, not taking nine years longer than it previously did from five years to 14 years to become legal citizens, hopefully slowing down the impact of new immigration from upsetting the apple cart of American politics. That's the Federalists trying to maintain their political order. The Sedition Act is also going to give the President of the United States very broad and expansive powers to punish people directly with fines, imprisonment, or possible deportation if they are actively speaking out against the government during a defined time of war. And even though Congress never formally declared war against 
France during this quasi-war, President Adams is going to make the case that he is acting as commander-in-chief uh, to make sure that we do not go to war. Um, he's also maintaining that it's his responsibility to censure individuals who may try to incite a rebellion against the U.S. government. Now, was there a danger that the Democrat Republicans are going to overthrow the U.S. government? Well, probably not as a revolution as terms of fighting people in the streets and killing people. Um, the Federalists are very concerned that their heads may be on the chopping blocks like the French Revolution just a few years earlier. That's not really likely. However, uh, in ironic terms, a lot of these actions by the Federalist-dominated government is going to lead to a political revolution during the election of 1800. So the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions uh, written in secret, in secret by Vice President Thomas Jefferson. So he's still a member of the Adams administration, although not a friendly one. And he's actually getting ready to leave the administration officially and just go home to Monticello in Virginia. He's going to write the Kentucky resolution. And James Madison, who had left the House of Representatives and went back to Virginia by 1798, he's actually a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. So that's kind of like their House of Representatives in their state legislature or general assembly. Okay, they're going to write these essentially in secret and have them re, uh, introduced by members of the Kentucky and Virginia uh, state legislatures. In fact, you could probably argue that if John Adams found out that Thomas Jefferson was involved in these two resolutions, that he may have been able to use the power of the federal government to arrest the sitting vice president of the United States in violation of the Sedition Act because this is definitely going to be speaking out against the federal government. So let's let's see what they might be thinking, okay? One, Jefferson and Madison don't have a lot of weapons at their disposal to respond to the Alien and Sedition Acts. Let's, let's remind ourselves, the President of the United States is a Federalist. Both houses of Congress are dominated by Federalists. That's how they're able to write such a broad and expansive Alien and Sedition Acts. And most of the judicial officers, judges, uh, and justices of the United States federal judicial branch have been appointed by Federalists. So uh, they don't think they have a way to stand up and combat this in the federal government level. They don't think that they can necessarily just argue in the court of public opinion and it'll go away. In fact, they're afraid that if they continue to argue um, in public squares and in newspaper editorials, that those people working with them will probably be locked up and detained like Thomas Cooper was, um, and like their good friend, Congressman Matthew Lyon, is currently locked up. So one way of thinking about this is Jefferson and Madison are looking for a way to respond to the Alien and Sedition Acts in a way that they think they might be able to be successful. So they introduced these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, and their goal is to define a couple of define a couple of ideas. So if you're taking notes, let's write these down because they're pretty good ones to outline. They're going to argue that one, the several states of the federal union are united by something like a compact. A compact is more like a uh, an agreement of all the members without giving up their sovereignty very similar to a confederation <clears throat> which had expired at the end of the Articles of Confederation Congress. So this first step that they're going to make, this assertion, asserted claim, is that the states are somehow still retaining more sovereignty than the federal government's letting on. And we'll, we'll talk about that and how the U.S. Constitution refers to that as well. They believe that the U.S. Constitution says that federal um, authority is limited by something called enumerated powers and rights, which means that if it's not directly explicitly stated in the U.S. Constitution, the states and the people should be able to expect that their rights and powers are reserved to them underneath the U.S. Constitution. Remember our conversation about the Ninth and Tenth Amendment in the Bill of Rights, we can say that if it's not expressly stated in the U.S. Constitution, those powers are reserved to the several states and to the people. There's also some stuff in the original text of the U.S. Constitution that we have to pay attention to as well. 
Jefferson and Madison are going to claim that each state has the right and duty to determine the constitutionality of federal laws. So states should determine whether or not the federal government is acting appropriately in making a law or in executing a particular law. And they'll be able to say, um, you're not acting constitutionally. That's not how that law should apply to the U.S. Constitution. Now, today, that is something that our federal judicial branch does. And ultimately, the Supreme Court of the United States is responsible for determining the constitutionality of federal laws and the constitutionality of actions by officers of the federal government. But you have to keep in mind that the Supreme Court of 1798 is not very powerful. They haven't heard many cases, and most people don't look to them as um, a, a tripartite or co-equal part of the federal government. They're kind of just there to resolve disputes, and they really don't have a lot of credibility or force yet. So this, this idea that the states should be able to to determine the constitutionality of something, um, that is a power that now we kind of expect our Supreme Court to handle. And it won't be long during the Jefferson administration where we're going to see a new character, someone we talked about uh, during the XYZ affair, uh, John Marshall. He's really going to grow the Supreme Court into the uh, instrument that it has today with this power of judicial review. We'll look at that. Additionally, Madison and Jefferson are going to claim that not only can states determine the constitutionality of laws and actions, but they can block them through processes called nullification or interposition of the states. That they can somehow overturn or ignore these laws and actions or policies of the federal government if they believe at the state level they are harmful to the interpretation and the fulfillment of the goals of the U.S. Constitution. Now, is what they're saying legitimate? Now, let's look at the, the compact idea first. This compact theory um, is going to be resurrected again by states that are thinking about seceding from the Union in the, uh, mi the early to middle 19th century. And eventually they're going to, be, they're going to attempt to do that uh, through, through acts of proposed secession by southern states at the beginning of the U.S. Civil War. Lincoln's going to look at some of these arguments as well, and he's going to come to the same result that many states did in 1798, that you can call the union of several states what you want. But there's one thing that is entirely clear. You cannot forget about the fact that states voluntarily ratified the U.S. Constitution, and new states that decided to join the union of several states and, and adopt the U.S. Constitution, had to agree to those terms as well. So it's going to be a little wishy-washy to pretend like you want to preserve the sanctity of the U.S. Constitution, but somehow doubt the perpetual union of all these several states into something that was more firm and more uh, eternal than necessarily the states deciding to play along in a compact. Now, let's talk about uh, whether or not the states think the government is going too far with uh, breaking this bond or pledge to only act with enumerated powers. We know that the uh, legislative branch specifically uh, in Article 1 refers to powers that are uniquely um, part of, the, of Congress and the federal government's domain. And those are in Article 1, Section 8. But if we look down to the last clause of Article 1, Section 8, which has been uh, fondly referred to as the elastic clause or the necessary and proper clause. We know that the government has the power to make laws that are necessary and proper to solving problems for all the states. Uh, Anti-federalists claimed in 1787, uh, 1788, 1789, that the elastic clause would be stretched to fit anything that the federal government wanted to do, and it could somehow dilute or erode the actual existence of the states. I don't think that's what the Federalists are trying to do. However, they are trying to make sure that no one's going to stand up to them. So can the states stand up to the federal government? If you re refer to your Constitution online, this is Article 6 VI, deals with the federal government assuming the debts of the several states, the supremacy clause, oaths for taking office, and a ban on religious tests for office. It says 
This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, and anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Which means in our new pyramid of federalism, the federal government is going to be at the top of the food chain. And the several states can complain about laws that the federal government is making, but ultimately the federal government, which in theory is supposed to be directly represented uh, by the people's representatives, they're going to be it's going to be operated by the people's representatives, uh, that should and will be more permanent and uh, will act as a trump card against the desires and wishes of the states. Now, today we know that because the judicial branch has been elevated and has the power to examine uh, the constitutionality of federal laws and actions, that states can sue uh, specific elements of federal law. They can sue in court to see if they, to have them examined to see if they truly are constitutional or not. But in 1798 and 1799, uh, Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Madison know that's not realistic at all. So they're trying to take this goal of examining constitutionality of a law or an action, and they're trying to to take that desire and place it with the several states. Now, does it work? Let's look at the results. We're going to go back to our map real quick. Six, uh, excuse me, 16 states, Kentucky and Virginia are two of them. They pass these resolutions and they try to circulate them among all the other several states because their goal is to get the other states to adopt similar resolutions so that the federal government essentially caves or realizes that the Alien and Sedition Acts are not going to be enforced in their own state borders. And it's going to be kind of like a showdown between state governments unifying together and the federal government. Uh, you're seeing some of this type of showdown today during the uh, coronavirus pandemic where state leaders are trying to rally together with other state leaders and force the federal government to increase aid packages and resources to their specific states. The federal government's pushing back and trying to direct some of that traffic to areas that they think are most important. And there's definitely a lot of name calling and finger pointing um, because it's a little bit of a showdown between regional alliances and state uh, authorities uh, that they believe that they have to fulfill in their own state constitutions the federal government is pushing back uh, with, with something I'm going to talk about next, which is the supremacy clause that I just read back, read to you in the Article 6. Okay, Now, two states propose them. No other states adopt them. In fact, uh, of the remaining 14 states that do get copies of these resolutions in the mail, um, four of them review them and they actively respond in writing to Kentucky and Virginia that they don't agree with them. And they don't agree with them for the same reasons that I just explained to you. They believe that the federal government underneath the Elastic Clause and underneath the Supremacy Clause have the authority to make these laws, even though the states might not deem them appropriate. So they know that there's no real way to respond other than getting more people elected to the federal Congress or electing a new president or eventually nominating new federal judges to somehow overturn the tide of, of federalist office holders that are making these policies, um, using the actual levers of voting to gain representation and change laws. Um, those four states disagree. And that's I'm really glad they did in writing because we can kind of see them using the same arguments that I outlined to you for why this is not going to constitutionally or legally work, these resolutions, okay? Ten of the states completely ignore them at all, Com completely ignore the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And if you kind of look at the context of the history of the Kentucky and resolutions, later on, James Madison kind of writes down and explains to people that he and Thomas Jefferson never really expected um, the other 14 states to get on board with this and approve it. I guess that's kind of convenient, and there's no real way of knowing if Mr. Madison's being completely honest with us or if he's just trying to paint the picture in a very intelligent, almost like a political gamesmanship strategy, um, because he argues that he and Jefferson intended to use these to rally support against the Alien and Sedition Acts rather than truly be able to block federal laws or actions. And that might be true. 
because we do know that uh, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions are going to be used to kind of elevate propaganda. Um, since it's a government uh, entity, the Kentucky and Virginia state legislature is making these claims, the same claims that Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Madison and the Democrat Republicans uh, were trying to make in, uh, in, in towns and cities and villages, um, in their newspapers and their editorials. And some of them were being uh, fined or they were being locked up because they were speaking against the government, the actions of the government. It's kind of hard to to arrest all of the members of the Kentucky and Virginia Assembly. So they feel a little bit safe and a little bit protected. It feels more formal than just people complaining out loud in the public uh, arena. So in a way, this is very formal, organized political propaganda. Um, does it work? Well, we know that in the election of 1800, uh, John Adams is not even going to be one of the top two candidates. In fact, uh, the top two candidates for president of the United States are both going to be Democrat Republicans. The entire idea was that Thomas Jefferson was going to be the clean, no doubt winner, uh, president of the United States. And a guy named Aaron Burr from New York, uh, a rising political player who's actually uh, former friends and, and uh, law associate with Alexander Hamilton, he's supposed to earn enough support to become vice president. Uh, something crazy is going to happen to kind of throw a wrench into that. But the Federalists themselves are going to lose support for John Adams. I told you namely because of the political feud between Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. Hamilton's going to try to run his own candidate for president of the United States, and that's going to backfire. And John Adams is going to have just enough federal support uh, to become kind of like the third place guy in all of this. So we are going to have a new president from a new political party um, to hold that office, and times are going to change. So <clears throat> I think we can we can the main two factors that are going to lead to John Adams' elect electoral loss in the fall of 1800 is going to be the fact that uh, the Federalists don't agree that he wants to play ball the way that they want to do. So you have dissension in the Federalist Party. It's splitting between Adams and Hamilton. And then you also have the public learning more about the Alien and Sedition Acts through the interpretation, through the understanding that the Democrat Republicans are creating for them using things like the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions to understand that what the Federalists may have done may not be legitimate, appropriate, or constitutional, making people think about that, and then making sure that these potential voters in new states, particularly in the growing West and South, um, are going to pull the lever for Democrat-Republican candidates rather than Federalist ones. Now, long-term consequences of the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, I alluded to earlier, these documents, if they truly were created for political propaganda, they're going to be utilized in different measures later on before the American Civil War. You're going to have Southern leaders that are interested in seceding in order to uh, retain slavery as part of their, their legal state constitutions uh, and their economic and civil institutions within their own state societies. They're going to reach back and look at the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions to try to create a legal um, a legal uh, theory for nullification as early as the 1830s um, by South Carolina, specifically a man by the name of John C. Calhoun, the idea that states should be able to nullify or interpose to block, ignore, or overturn actions of the federal government that they believe are unconstitutional or detrimental to their own states. So this is not going to go away. Uh, just because we've talked about it once, and we'll talk about this obviously in the next few weeks as we get to uh, the era of American expansionism, and we have to question what do we do with slavery when we create new states, okay? Uh, you should have enough information now through this video to answer all your questions for the Adams administration, and if you don't, you should reach out to me today for extra help. I would love to help you with that. I want to remind you that today, Thursday, April 9th, there will be a Facebook Live session at 4 p.m., the last one of the week. And tomorrow, I am going to uh, post all of our introductory materials for the Jefferson administration, the Revolution of 1800, 
and the beginning of something that we'll like to call the era of republicanism. Okay, you won't need to re review um, those materials until we get to Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, you do have a writing assignment comparing and contrasting the Alien and Sedition Acts with the Patriot Act that was passed by Congress um, following the September 11th, 2001 uh, terrorist attacks in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That writing assignment is not due until next Wednesday, and you can feel free to ask me questions about it today at the Facebook Live session at 4 p.m. Okay, I hope you have a great uh, Easter weekend with your with your parents and remember that you can contact me by text phone or email i will have it on and i would gladly talk to you about this have a great day it's going to be chilly and cold out there so you might as well get some work done in class and uh, i will see you later on tuesday which will be day 139 19th day of remote learning have a great day everyone